Welcome, my name is Oliver Sturm. Um, I work with a company called DevExpress, which is otherwise entirely irrelevant uh, to this talk, but it means that I do some work with web technologies uh, because we create reusable products for web developers and HTML-based developers and so on. Uh, that's the background that I have. And I'm here today to talk to you about JavaScript. Um, the structural problem is the catchy title I came up with there. It's basically about modularization patterns about structuring your code uh, in certain ways using particular technical approaches and uh, standard patterns that are out there. Okay, so um, I've got a slide here with a bit of an agenda overview. Um, the door opens, fair enough. Uh, but what I would like to talk to you about today is, first of all, where does this idea of structuring JavaScript code come from in the first place? I mean, you may have been developing traditional uh, web applications for a pretty long time without ever having to think very much about structuring your JavaScript code, right? Potentially, you even do that today, that's fair enough. Um, but where does that idea come from? That will be my first point. I'd like to talk about some of the technical basics in the JavaScript language that are used uh, to make modularization happen, typically, uh, IFEs and uh, the module pattern that is heavily based on IFEs. And then I'd like to get into uh, two of the standard patterns with common JS modules and AMD modules that are typically used in JavaScript-based applications, both on server and uh, client or browser side, and uh, say something about those, as well as uh, about the loaders, uh, or at least one in particular, and combining different techniques to get those modules uh, loaded into your applications. That, so that's what I have in mind for the, for the next hour. Um, right, so who is a, 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 a JavaScript app developer out of all you here? Can we see a show of hands? Okay, that's just a few of you. Fair enough, that's good. So for, for at least the others, <laughs> uh, some of what I'm going to say is probably quite new then. Um, although, of course, you know, website developers may have experience with JavaScript, of course, don't get me the wrong way, but it's usually in a slightly different area, is my experience, than it is for app developers. So, um, structuring JavaScript code, the why of it, that's my first question, as I outlined before. So, uh, the, the idea is that you might have a considerable amount of JavaScript, quite obviously, if you're just going to hack the odd piece of code into some existing framework, you know, fill in the gaps kind of thing, pop a little JavaScript code in your HTML directly to handle some events and that kind of stuff. If that's what you do, you don't normally need to think very much about structuring your code, because it, uh, well, there's just not enough of it to warrant much consideration, apart from maybe general guidelines, like uh, pull your code into a separate file if you can, instead of having a, you know, long-winded uh, script sections in your HTML, that's, that's fair enough, we know that, right? But uh, otherwise, there might not be very much else that you need to do to structure. So the idea of structuring your code comes up in uh, those cases that I've listed here, basically, you can read. So it's about applications that are written for use on the server side, which is usually associated with larger amounts of code that implement application logic, that potentially make you know, business logic happen on the server side, and so on. This might might be node applications, for example, being probably the primary platform for server-side JavaScript execution today. Um, we also have client applications that are written purely on an HTML JavaScript basis. Of course, we see more and more of these these days. Uh, it used to be the, the prime example was always the Google Docs, you know, stuff like that, that, that are, of course, purely HTML JavaScript-based applications. However, these days, we see loads of those everywhere, so it doesn't really warrant that much that much of an explanation. Um, the idea with those applications is, of course, if you're really new to the topic by any chance, uh, that you're going to have a client app like you might have had at any point in time in a native environment, like a Windows application or maybe a Macintosh application or whatever else, uh, but it is going to be implemented in HTML and JavaScript, and that comes with all the same issues and problems and challenges that client-side applications have always had. The architecture, there's so much different code mixed in there for you know, data access layers and UI layers and business functionality in between and so on, that obviously the idea of structuring that code is, is, a, is, is an easy one to come up with. So that's that part. And the mobile apps that I'm listing separately are typically quite similar these days.
these days because uh, frequently people use uh, the same techniques that you use to create those client applications I was m mentioning earlier. Um, to make those available on mobile devices, people now use the same technology stacks. These might be elaborate frameworks. Perhaps you, you use AngularJS or Ember or any of those existing ones you know, that basically enable single page applications. That's typically the main pattern that is implemented by these frameworks. And that's the kind of thing you, you might do for mobile applications as well today. Uh, plus, probably some kind of a transition layer, maybe phone gap or something like that, that actually allows you to bring that application onto the device and uh, use some of the native functionality, like built-in hardware of the device and stuff like that as well. So um, that is the other part. And the fourth item I've listed is reusable modules, which means, of course, if you're going to create something for other people to reuse, you need to think about modularization, right? If you're going to write the next jQuery, that's fair enough. <laughs> maybe you're not. But maybe you're going to create a pretty complex library for consumption in your own enterprise environment. Right? People do that. So, uh, you know, other people, other developers from other departments, for example, might have the need to reuse what you have created or to actually use it in the first place. Reuse always is always the second step, isn't it? So, using what you have created um, in a flexible way can bring up the same challenges of modularization that you are faced with yourself. If you use jQuery, for example, you're familiar with the way they have, uh, um, um, well, a structure of sub-modules, if you like, that you can pull in selectively, right? It's, it's even their third-party infrastructure. There are millions of add-ons for jQuery that you can choose to add into the mix for your own application. So that's the kind of modularization that you may want to use yourself, uh, like I said, even in the environment of uh, enterprise-level uh, HTML JavaScript-based applications. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about when we come to the idea of structuring our JavaScript code. Um, and I, I did want to outline that before uh, you walk away thinking, that's, that's a very odd idea, what he's been talking about. So that's the thing. Right, now, the iffy, <laughs> that's the interesting little pronunciation people have come up for this uh, 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 acronym here, I-I-F-E, right? Uh, somebody thought that looks almost like iffy, and iffy in English means something like a bit weird, odd kind of thing. So um, they, they thought that was a funny pronunciation uh, for it. Uh, R, the technical basis of uh, what we call the module pattern, which is usually attributed to Douglas Crockford, but uh, lots of stuff has been written about it, so I don't think anybody actually claims the idea for themselves necessarily, but the module pattern makes uh, lots of use of the IFI uh, as, as a technical feature, and the IFI itself is the immediately invoked function expression, as it says down there, um, which is a JavaScript feature that I'm going to show you in a moment. I, I guess most of you are familiar with the basic way that it works, but I find it quite interesting to look at some of the details of how it is used with the module pattern to enable uh, the kind of structural um, module creation and extension and so on that is the basis of many modularization systems. So I'll, I'll show you some demos for that one um, in just a second, actually. Let's see what we have. Um, oh, well, I can see my editor. You can't. There we go. Um, that's probably not large enough for everybody, is it? So let's make that larger. Is that big enough? No? Somebody say no. That was a joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I'll go for a compromise, like so. Is that okay for people in the back there? Can you read it? Okay, brilliant. <laughs> right, so um, I've got this very basic piece of code here. Uh, let me just quickly here. Oh, there we go. A uh, basic piece of code where uh, I'm creating a logger, only I'm not actually creating a logger right now. Now, let's say uh, I would like to create a logger uh, with this little helper function here, and I might do this by returning a new function, of course, uh, which will take a piece of text as a parameter. I can't tell you why it's highlighting the 
X right now. Oh, because it says X down here, huh? Oh, that's weird. Why did I search for X? I don't remember. There you go, function. So this will be the function that I will return, and this function that I'll return will uh, just output something on the console for simplicity, right? So we'll just do this, and then, well, maybe we're just going to do the text for a start. I mean, this little piece of code here would do the job, just to make that point, and conform with the little API oops, uh, that I've created. Now, um, for purposes of uh, demonstrating to you how this execution works, I'm going to run this uh, in Node. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. There are obviously people with lots of different backgrounds here. So Node is basically a server-side JavaScript execution engine, which allows me to just go ahead and uh, run one of these scripts that I'll be working with. Uh, this one is called that, I think. And, um, then obviously it'll just say uh, something happened and something else happened because that's what I'm uh, using my logger here for. So that one works just fine. Now, um, something you can do in the context of a, a little function like this here is to take advantage of the closure functionality of JavaScript, pretty basic thing really. What that means is if I have some kind of a variable on this level right here, um, I've got some funny windows on my other screen here, sorry about that. If I've got some uh, variable on here, let's call this output counter, and uh, give it an initial value perhaps, I can then utilize that value inside the function that I'm returning. Um, so perhaps I'm going to put in something like this here, just put the output counter in there, and then we're going to do closing paren like so, something like that, right? So I'm piecing together a, a slightly prettier output for my line. Oh, and I could also go and uh, increment the output counter in there like this, right, perhaps. Um, and then uh, if I've done that uh, roughly the right way, I should now see that it counts, right? It says my log output has now got uh, numbers in front of each of the lines. And uh, well, I mean, if you're not familiar with the feature of closures, you may wonder perhaps uh, why the counting thing even happens. Because basically, well, this function is what's being returned to my main scope here. That's my manual logger in the end. And the function has a reference to this output counter thing. Uh, that's the no quite non-obvious part, really, if you're totally unfamiliar with closures for some reason. So I'm just explaining it shortly. Um, that's the way it works. JavaScript knows that this, fun this, uh, this variable here has to stay around for use by the other, by the other function and um, it makes it available and that's it. So you can now use that variable as a private field if you like. Now, um, in order to make that thing an iffy, um, we basically change a little bit, a little something about the uh, implementation here. Let me add this uh, to the bottom. And what we usually do is put some additional parens around this thing here. And then we add another set of parens. Well, actually, you can either add those uh, inside this pair or um, behind it. That, that's basically roughly the same thing. What it means is that this function that goes from here to there, just for clarity, right? This function that I've now created is being executed immediately. So that's the aspect of immediately invoked, right? That's the double I uh, in the beginning of the IFI acronym right there. So instead of just taking the function like I do up here, I'm just declaring it, right? And now I'm storing it away. Of course, the syntax needs to be changed a bit still. So I wouldn't normally have um, any kind of name on this function, right? That's just an anonymous thing. And uh, equally obviously, I'm also returning something from this function, and that's uh, so I, I'm not currently storing this return value. So I could uh, do something like var uh, ify logger equals that thing, right? And as, as a result, I have now created this anonymous function, like so, uh, up to here. And I've also uh, invoked it right away with the pair of parens there. And the result of that whole operation is now stored inside iffy logger again. What you usually do in addition to this, though, is to uh, extend your return result just a little bit. Uh, so what you normally do is return a new object that has perhaps a method or a function. Well, I'm calling it a method because it vaguely resembles the idea of object-oriented structures there, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's call it a function for now. And this function I'll call log, and that's where my existing implementation here goes. Right? Let me just wrap this around a bit so we can see everything. Um, 
and I think now I'm uh, missing a uh, another curly right there. I think like so. That's uh, that's the one for the new object. No, that's the one for the function now. Fair enough. And this is the one for the new object. So maybe indent that a little so we can see what's going on. So with this kind of syntax, this is what you might encounter quite frequently when ifs are being used. Uh, we have this immediately executed function that basically has its own internal state. That's what we talk about in the context. And it returns a new object uh, that has functionality. And the functionality of that new object in turn utilizes um, the internal state in some way, um, well, privately, really. So um, let's see if the ify logger works. Uh, ify logger, well, this is an object now which has a, a function called log on it. And I can now say, again, you know, something uh, Else happened? No, we've already got that one. <laughs> okay, let's. That's. Uh, whoops. Uh, sorry about that. Some funny keys there. Um, a third thing happened, right? That well, that would fit better. Um, and then, just save that and uh, see what what happens when I run it again. And it starts counting from one again. Says a third thing happened. And let's uh, duplicate this here, perhaps, and call this a fourth thing happened. <laughs> so we can distinguish what's happening, of course. And there we go. So my new logger implementation is still able to log in the same way as the old one did, utilizing, like I said, that internal state part that I have in there. Um, but I've now got this implementation based on um, the ify pattern in JavaScript. Now, um, what's the advantage of, of having this thing right there? Any ideas? Anybody? In a nutshell, please. I'm not cluttering the global scope with variables. Yes, that is correct. So in comparison to the first uh, variation at the top this year, I'm not declaring this function in the global scope, basically. right? So instead of doing that, I've just got the anonymous function. And this, of course, is a scoped variable again. So what, whatever scope I would be in right now, uh, that's where my, my newly created uh, element, <laughs> I'll, I'll just call it that, uh, will be stored. So I'm not cluttering my object space. Yes, that's exactly important. Um, the other part with ifies is basically the same thing as you get with the function declaration, however, which is that I'm creating a scope, right? That's the, the important basic idea, of course. Um, by using this particular closure-based syntax, I'm creating a scope for certain items to live inside without uh, the, well, being able or f allowing anybody to access these items from the outside unless through some particular public API that I'm creating. So my public API, of course, is that log function, and my private information is my output counter, and that is only accessible to me in a particular way that I implement and not to anybody else looking at the object from the outside. Um, Right, so these are the two factors really combined. I've got uh, just a few more examples for completeness sake here. I think this code should look pretty similar to what we just did. Um, oh, I, I'm pointing out here that you can have those, uh, the, well, that final pair of parens here in different locations, right, just so you've seen that syntax in comparison. Um, uh, oh, what's not possible, by the way, is this syntax right here, where you don't use a pair of parens around this function part here, and then just follow it up with that thing. I mean, you might expect, perhaps, uh, that this element that I'm highlighting is a complete function declaration, right? However, uh, in JavaScript, that is exactly what it is. It's a declaration, and it is not an expression. And for that reason, it's evaluated differently. So that's why you have to make JavaScript understand that you mean for this to be an expression. And the usual way of doing this is using the paren syntax above. However, sometimes you see stuff like this here at the bottom, these uh, three variations. All of those work, even though there's no parens around the function thing, because the, uh, the well, through the use of these additional items, like the, the tilde sign here, zero, comma, or true, double and, you can also make JavaScript understand that this is an expression that is being evaluated, right? So that's got the same same effect, and some people use it. I think it's pretty crazy, isn't it? If you've got code lines starting with uh, zero comma for no particular reason. I think that's pretty weird, but I've seen it quite a few times, so you might encounter this somewhere. Just remember, this is just a very odd way of uh, using ifies in a pretty weird syntax there. Fair enough. Um, or maybe you prefer it. Anybody prefers it? No? 
<laughs> okay, I see somebody doing this, right? So, yeah. <laughs> All right, no, I don't prefer that either, but I, I've seen it. I mean, especially the tooly thing here, I think some people really like doing that. It's kind of crazy, fair enough. Okay, so I just had those in for completeness sake. Now, um, I've also got a little file here with uh, some examples of um, the module pattern based on the IFI syntax. So, for a start in my demo here, I've got this uh, little element called an adder defined, and it basically works exactly like what we've seen a moment ago, right? This adder is a simple IFI defined object, and it doesn't even use any internal state. So, um, you know, you don't obviously have to do that, but it's also an example for a very simple item that you might use in modularization. Now, this thing should be able to add two values together, quite obviously. Let me just uh, jump to the console one time and enter uh, node module patterns, and we'll see that the first item it outputs says, adding five and three gives me eight. That sounds uh, vaguely correct, so we'll just assume for now that the adder is doing its job, okay? Right, so um, we're using an iffy for that one. Now, I'm going to construct a calculator here, and again, I'm using the iffy pattern for the calculator, but I'm making my calculator based on the adder, which kind of makes sense, right? If you've already got an adder, and in reality, maybe other little building blocks as well, uh, and you create something a little more complicated, like the calculator, you may, might want to reuse the adder functionality. That's the idea here, right? So I'm sorry for using simple examples, or really, I'm not really, but... <laughs> Uh, the point, of course, is that this, this, this shows a certain pattern of reuse and, and using building blocks to construct more complex things out of them. So um, my adder is simply used in here, right? So that is, of course, the global adder that has now cluttered my namespace, basically. At least, well, actually, in this case, it hasn't, not quite so badly, at least, because at least it's a var, right? So <laughs> it's only in my scope, whatever that really is. But still, that's where it is. And and uh, one of the things that is actually frequently overlooked when people uh, use that type of an approach where they just assume that they can access anything that is in a wider scope than where the current piece of code runs in is the fact that JavaScript really takes longer to resolve these chains, of, as we say, um, for objects that are found higher up in the hierarchy right, of, of scopes, basically. So, uh, in reality, if you do this all the time, and you have pretty deeply nested hierarchies of scopes, because you do use ifis quite a bit, and maybe you use some libraries that also use ifis internally, you may end up having to, uh, having quite a distance between the uh, the adder object on the global scope, more or less, right, and, and the current piece of code that is being executed. And JavaScript has to walk up that stack, basically, to find out out where the adder object is from, where does it belong. And uh, that takes time, unfortunately. So uh, there have been some benchmarks that I've seen where it varies somewhat between browsers, how they handle it, and so on. Um, however, that's one reason alone why it's not necessarily a good idea to just do this everywhere. Plus, of course, structurally, it sucks to go that way, right? So, because you're going to have a lot of items somewhere in a larger namespace uh, scope, if you like, and uh, accessing those globally just doesn't make a lot of sense in a larger environment. So uh, it works, nevertheless. I mean, we've seen the output already here. That's the first one. Adding with the first calculator, I think, is what this one says exactly. And of course, it still works reusing the adder in this way. Now, um, moving along, I could do this. Instead of using the adder from its global namespace, I get the adder passed in to my function that is inside the iffy, if you like. Um, and of course, I have to list it down here again as well. Now, um, I mean, since this is an example, you could argue now that in order to create my calculator, I still need to look up the global adder. Right? Well, that's fair enough, and I'm only using it in the one method in there, but consider I might be using it thousands of times, however. I could call that particular, or was saying method, that particular function on the object right there. I could call this a thousand times if I liked, and at least now I don't have that long lookup chain for the adder object anymore when it is evaluated here. 
Okay, so it only happens once on the construction of my object uh, that the adder is looked up from the global namespace. It is then passed into the function, and basically the adder variable, uh, the, the parameter to the function, is now handled in the same way that I was uh, telling you about with the, when I said we've got private state on the inside of that, that iffy thing, right? The closure has that information now. So it's like a, like a variable that has been declared in the screen scope, and as a result, it is uh, kept available again for later use. And that's what happens when I finally end up calling the add function. Now, my adder object doesn't have to be looked up in any low global scope anymore, or in any scope really, apart from my own. So that's where it's found most quickly, quite obviously, and that's the most performant way you can go with this. The syntax of it, you would probably already recognize if you've been reading around some JavaScript libraries occasionally, because the, the way they you have certain variables hanging around at the end of that particular iffy evaluation expression. Uh, that's usually, uh, or looks uh, the same way, typically. Um, oh, right. I have uh, mentioned this here, that uh, occasionally you see things like this here. Well, I'm not going to uncomment this, right? So people use the same expression or the same kind of pattern to pass in a reference to something global, like the jQuery object, for instance, right? So if you create an iffy, and you're going to be using jQuery inside your implementation right there, you still have the exact same choice. You can either just access the jQuery object, or of course it's dollar standard representation right there. You can access that directly from the global scope, where you might have imported it or required it, or whatever it is exactly. Um, and that'll work technically. However, if you make a lot of calls to that object, it's going to take quite a while to evaluate all those. And that's the idea why somebody you might then pass in the jQuery object like so, and it's uh, received up here in a variable that simply has the name dollar, right? So again, you're back to the usual syntax for most of us when using jQuery, where you just use the dollar as a shortcut to the jQuery object. In case you're not familiar with it, this is optional, right? That's why I'm talking about it like that, because uh, using the dollar is just a, a default convention when using jQuery on the browser side. That's how jQuery installs itself in there. But if you use it on the server side, for instance, it does not install its, it, its own variable in the global space, so you don't have the dollar unless you create it yourself. Instead, you might have an object called jQuery, or depending on your module concept, which I'm going to get to in the end, uh, you might have some other kind of variable, of course, that, that refers to a library like jQuery. So um, th that pattern can be found quite frequently, and that's just what I wanted to point out here. Now, this is where it gets more exciting, um, because moving ahead with the module pattern, I'm now creating my calculator in a slightly different way. And the idea with this is that I'm, I'll be able to augment my calculator. So let's start calling my calculator a module, shall we? Because that's what I have in mind here, really. Um, of course, you know, some people prefer particular naming patterns for, uh, for modules, so they might call the calculator in all caps or something if it's a module. Uh, well, that's up to you, really. You know, naming conventions in JavaScript are pretty flexible. I don't normally, or not always, tend to do that myself, to be honest, but uh, whatever, whatever you like. So uh, the difference, the important difference is, actually looking at the one down here first, perhaps, is that uh, I'm taking a parameter here, which I'm calling me, don't have to do that, really. You can call it anything you like. Um, and that parameter represents an object that is also a calculator already. Right? That's the idea. Now, the parameter that I'm passing in here is either an existing calculator object, or in case we don't have a calculator object yet, I'm just passing in an empty object as an initialization, uh, really, for that newly created object. Now, the, the line here where the, uh, where the function is added just looks a little different, right? Because I'm assigning this new, new function, the multiplication in this case, to a, a variable in that me object. So that's, I did it differently before, just for comparison. Let's quickly check back here where my add was just you know, a field in this newly created object that I set up, right? So instead, we're now assuming that we already have an object, which may, of course, on the first run, be an empty one. And then I'm just adding an item, in this case multiplication, to this new object and returning that object again, 
right? So um, the add up there for, uh, works exactly the same way with the addition of the other parameter that we had previously, right? So that's why I'm jumping a little, but the adder otherwise is defined exactly the same way. The interesting thing with this approach is we call it loose augmentation because it means that you can now evaluate those blocks here in any order you like. Think about it. The, the add comes first, and it's initialized based on an empty object here, right? So in this case, because we don't have a calculator yet, that's the assumption at least, we're going to use an empty one instead. And uh, the second one here already has a calculator. So the one that I've created before that already has an add method or function is passed in again, and the mult function is then added. But it could equally well work the other way around. Right? There's no difference. That's why we call it loose augmentation. Well, augmentation, first of all, is the term that you use for the idea of adding something into an existing item at a later point in time. Right? So just to be clear on that one. And loose is because we don't have a particular initialization order in mind. Now, if you think modularization, that is, of course, a very useful idea, isn't it? Because you can now, you don't have to assume anything about the order that your, uh, your modules will be loaded in. If you assume that these items may actually live in separate modules in the end, in separate JavaScript files, perhaps, right, for a start, you don't have to assume anything about the order that those files are loaded in, that they're evaluated for some reason. Okay, so that's an important part, really. Loose augmentation allows you to, cre to create modules that are extended after the fact. And you can, of course, do the same thing with uh, modules that somebody else has written, for example, right? To be a bit more complex there, um, without making any assumptions about the way those modules will be used by somebody else later on. Whether they include the one or the other block first in their code doesn't matter to you at all. Um, I think by now we're at the multiplying with the augmented calculator thing down here, just to jump back and forth a bit, so <laughs> it obviously works, otherwise I wouldn't be showing it to you, but <laughs> just so you believe me. There we go. Um, order irrelevant at this point. I've got another example down here um, where I'm overriding a piece of functionality, right? So in this case, I'm using an existing calculator object and I'm retrieving an item from it, in this case my mult function right there, and I'm just overriding it with uh, some pretty crazy thing that multiplies by three for no particular reason. And I thereby override the existing functionality. Of course it would be up to me, by the way, um, to make the old functionality, I mean I have it here, right? It's stored away in my internal state variable. If I wanted to, I could make that old function available somehow, you know, call it uh, old mult or mult underscore or something like that, and provide both implementations. No reason why not, right? So this is something you can do. In this case, however, we talk about tight augmentation. And the reason it's called tight augmentation is because now the initialization order matters. Quite obviously, I can't really go and replace old with new before I even have an old item to work with, right? So in this case, I'm not using the syntax with the or and the empty curlies and everything because it doesn't make much sense to begin the process of patching the existing calculator, if you like, unless I already have a calculator in the first place. So that's the idea, tight augmentation as opposed to loose that we've seen before. Now, I think uh, there's one more example in here, unless I'm mistaken. Yes, that is it. And uh, here, uh, that's just an example to show you uh, that, of course, while my samples have been pretty simple, we can still do the same thing with uh, any kind of additional internal state. Right? So in this case, I'm adding some storing functionality to my calculator, and I've got my own variable store up there, and I've got a number of functions that all, all work against that store. Um, and uh, that's, of course, the idea that your, your uh, individual initialization blocks don't always have to be quite so short as I made them there. I mean, sometimes it makes sense. It depends on the degree of reusability that you would like to achieve. Because every single individual item, like, for instance, my adder, my adder can't do anything but add, right? So that, that means it's not a very powerful object, but it also means that I might be able to reuse it in a large number of scenarios. The simpler the objects, the, be the better they are for building blocks, 
right? So that's the kind of thing you have to think about the granularity when it comes to modularization of what you're trying to achieve. Is it, uh, are you looking for the best possible reuse or are you looking for uh, most functionality in one place, perhaps, for some reason, right? So that's the kind of trade-off that you have to consider. Um, and well, obviously, uh, this last example also works uh, using the store private state here to stash away that individual value. Right, so that's the basics of that uh, iffy and module pattern thing. Oh, something I did want to mention is that some people criticize this module pattern and, uh, well, really the iffies, um, saying that they are bad to debug. Unfortunately, that is not entirely untrue. It depends a little on the kind of debugger that you use and so on. But uh, in general, um, it is a little hard to debug because the information that is stored in closures is not usually accessible easily uh, by a debugger. I mean, for a start, of course, it's not accessible through any public API, right? So if you have fields inside your closures that don't correspond to a direct in external API, for example, in my logger example, I did not have a helper function in there that would have allowed me to retrieve the output counter. Right? Well, maybe for some reason I would like to do that. I would like to know what the next output counter is going to be. But that's not part of the public API, and as a result, I don't have access to that information. And even a debugger typically can't do it. Um, I can show you just quickly in the node debugger um, how that, what that looks like. Let me just see. I've got my node inspector running, I think. Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, okay, I already had my node inspector running. <laughs> so then let's do uh, node uh, debug break module patterns. Uh, that means that the, uh, the script is going to start running and stop immediately on the first line, right? So now I can go to the browser. I think I have a browser. Let me get a new window here. Yeah, there we go. And um, in here, I'll need to go to the URL that it uh, shows me. Uh, oh, it doesn't. Fair enough. Localhost. Um, what is it then? 5858 or something like that, isn't it? I thought it was 58. Well, sorry about that. It is 58, isn't it? So why is that not in my history, though? Whoops. Um, that's not the right URL. <laughs> you never use it manually, do you? So let's see. Uh, I probably have it somewhere here. Uh, what the thing? Uh huh. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah right. Fair enough. Oops. No. <laughs> what on earth am I doing? Ah, there we go. <laughs> right, that's, that's the way it works. You don't actually have to connect to 5858 directly. That's a good point. Okay, so let's do that again. I've got the uh, node ins inspector running. I'll run my, my module pattern file, and now let's reload this page, and I should be able to see the node debugger coming up. Brilliant. Okay, so I don't know if you've seen that thing before, but this is a nice little module that allows you to use the node debugger with a browser-based debugging interface, similar to what you're familiar with from Chrome developer tools in my case or Firefox, of course, they all look very similar anyway these days, don't they? So I can now see my server-side code, and the thing that I was just going to point out to you is uh, down at the bottom, we've got this last example that I had, a bit larger maybe, um, that has uh, the internal state, right, with the store here. And uh, now the thing is, um, on a line like this here, uh, where the store is being modified, I can't even place a breakpoint. I'll just show you that again. I click here, click, and the breakpoint is established in the next possible location instead of this line 157, because the node inspector thing doesn't even allow me to put that breakpoint in the position where I would be able to access the store variable. And there is no way, when I get uh, perhaps to this point here, let's see, uh, let's just run through here. Now, um, you might be tempted to think that the calculator object um, should offer access somehow to what's inside it, right? So let me just expand this. Here we go. But there is nothing in there. The calculator has add, mult, retrieve, and so on uh, functions and, and other fields. But the, uh, the store that I can see here is only the function called store. The other one is just not visible at all. 
And that's not a problem of the name, by the way. It wouldn't be visible either if it had the name. It's just a private thing, right? It's in the closure, that's the thing. It's not a, it's not a field or a property or what, whatever you might imagine. It just lives inside the closure. Um, some of the debuggers that I've seen are able to place a breakpoint here, right? Oh, now it claims to be able to. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Let's see if we can actually utilize that. We can? <laughs> wow. Guys, I'm surprised, but uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Uh, interesting. I, I was not aware that this debugger is able to place the breakpoint there, apparently, at the point when the, inis the initialization has already happened, right? That's what it looks like, at least. I'd have to look into this in some detail. But the, the actual point I was going to make to you is only that the debugging, in any event, is rather complicated, because obviously, usually you will be interested in the state of one of those particular fields there. Uh, at a particular point in your application when something breaks, right? And at that point, of course, it doesn't usually help you very much if you think to yourself, hey, if only I'd had a breakpoint, you know, at that other point there uh, where, where the modification happened or something like that, because it's already too late for that. So my main point really is that you can't look inside the object once the value is already in there. You can't just access it like that, which is usually what you really need to do. And even if you, if you would like to track things down by just you know, stepping through all the various individual points where the value is being modified or retrieved and so on, I mean, we have certainly documented that it's not a straightforward process, right? <laughs> um, like I said, I've seen debuggers that can place breakpoints here. I, I was not aware that this one can do it under certain pretty odd circumstances, which is an interesting discovery. I'll have to look into that. Um, but the point is just that it's complicated and not exactly straightforward. So that's the criticism some people have of the module pattern, that while having those modules in the first place and having the, the privacy inside those objects of non-accessible internal state, that, is, that can be a hindrance as well. Right? That's the problem. Now, um, I had a point about this on my uh, slide as well, where it basically just says, be disciplined with your public APIs, right? Because that is my own personal point of view. Uh, for those of you who might have done coding with object-oriented programming languages, for example, we're kind of used to the idea in that space that uh, you know uh, classes and objects have got private state that is normally inaccessible from the outside. And if you're also doing a lot of automated testing and so on, you're familiar with the way you have to expose whatever you need uh, in a kind of a clean way, right? Make it available in the API if it has to be accessed from the outside. So uh, that's the thing. In my, in my eyes, um, you shouldn't probably normally have uh, too much internal state in an iffy constructed object that doesn't have a corresponding external API. I mean, for testing purposes, for a start, right? How are you ever going to test that this object actually works correctly unless you have some kind of a, an, a technique to access the, the management information that it holds internally to test that it's correct, right? So uh, from that point of view, um, I've seen these arguments quite a few times, and they are technically they are valid arguments, but my main thought at that point is always, well, why did you structure your, your API in just exactly that way in the first place, right? Of course, fair enough. Maybe somebody else has structured the API, and you're just stuck with it, and you would just like to find out you know, what's going wrong and so on. There's enough reasons for sure, but I don't think um, th there's a good reason not to be using the module pattern in that way, because in the end, it's pretty much the only way in JavaScript that you can establish this kind of secure context. Um, prototypes, for example, which is, of course, one of the standard mechanisms in JavaScript for uh, reuse in a, in a, well, a somewhat similar uh, approach to object-oriented techniques or so on. But it doesn't have the idea of defining visibility uh, on particular fields or, or functions or whatever you have, right? That's not part of the prototype system in JavaScript. So that's what you get here. All right, let me just check the time. That's good. OK, so um, all right, oh, we've seen that. Um, getting back on this idea of uh, module systems, um, we've got these two main contenders that, that I'm looking at here. In reality, there are quite a few other module systems out there that people have created since you know, whenever star they started using JavaScript. It's been around a while now, hasn't it? I think, isn't it 18 years or something like that? Can you believe it? <laughs> uh, so anyway, these are the two main really important ones these days. The common JS module system, which is mainly used on 
on the Sava side, it has been around longer than the others have as well. Um, and the AMD, the Asynchronous Module Definition, as it's called, which has been created as a bit of a spin-off almost from the common JS thing, they actually both come from the same group of standards uh, these days. But of course, in JavaScript, nothing is really a standard ever, right? So <laughs> uh, this one is used mainly in the browser because it solves the problem of uh, loading the modules that you have, including their dependencies, in an order that makes sense in the end. Um, and it also does this in the background, potentially, which is something that the common JS system doesn't really support you doing. There are, again, plugins and, and add-ons and whatever else uh, elsewhere that allow you to use common JS modules uh, in an asynchronous loading pattern, right? So there's a lot of mixed operation kind of approaches there as well. Now let's start with common JS. Common JS works by using an exports object uh, and uh, thereby publishing information to um, well, the loader, basically, whatever that means, right? So if you create a module, you have your functionality in there, or perhaps your data fields and your functions or your objects or whatever you have, and you just make those available selectively to the outer scope by assigning them to fields on this exports object. Occasionally, you just assign the entire exports object, in fact, just not just individual fields, but the whole thing, right? That's also an option. Um, that's the way this works. Now, from the outside, when your module is loaded, there is a require function used that will load the module and make sure that the object that has been passed back by the module, if you like, through this exports thing, is now made available to you uh, on the loading side. Right? That's the way that works. Um, oh, and the final bullet I've got in there, because I always forget to mention this, the require that is part of the spec here um, is required, in turn, to return immediately after loading or making available that module. So, and it's not expected to take any time whatsoever, really, uh, to do this. And that's the main reason why the common JS uh, structure was not initially usable in a scenario that runs in the browser, because in the browser, everything is more complicated, right? First of all, everything takes more time. If a new module JavaScript file or something has to be loaded, that doesn't happen immediately. There might be dependencies as well, so you've got a number of round trips and checks and whatever else. You may have more than just one source that you would like to go to to try to load your, your modules, right? Perhaps you've got a CDN deployment for your, for your main JavaScript files, and that's where you're going to go look first, and if it can't be found, you go look somewhere else and so on, right? So the loading process is typically much more complicated in the browser. Um, and uh, that did not fit in well with this particular part of the spec that says require should return immediately. So that's why they started doing something else then. Uh, now let's have a look at how that works. The, uh, the common JS module system here. Mm, there we are. So I've got a file here somewhere which is called uh, test. There we are. Um, and this thing uses uh, the syntax that I just outlined with a require call to load my calculator module from some other place, right? We don't have that thing defined yet, but this file already exists. Here it is. And um, I can now go in here and just do stuff like I just mentioned. I could just go exports.add equals function. Uh, if I can type function, there we go. X and Y, perhaps, and then we'll return X plus Y, like so, more or less. Um, now, the reason this is, uh, is possible immediately right here is that Node itself uses a, a pattern that is at least very, very close to the general common JS pattern for its module structure. So this helper function require is actually available readily in Node, and uh, so is the ability to use the exports feature for exporting the functionality. So if I'm going to run, um, oh, we're still in the debugger here. Uh, if I'm going to run my, uh, what's it called? called test calculator, uh, oops, common JS. There we go. That's the one. Um, I'll get an error because we don't support the multiplication yet, fair enough. I'm not exporting a multiply function, of course. But we do get the correct result of the add operation up there. 
right? So my, uh, my add function has been exported correctly from here, and I could also add in the, uh, the functionality of uh, the mult function in the same way, of course. However, what you typically end up doing is just reuse your existing definition of your calculator in my case here. So I might uh, use, oops, uh, sorry, funny keys. There we go. I might use these two blocks here, for example. Um, like so, and create my calculator in the usual way. Oh, of course, I also need my adder. Let's just copy that one in for now. There we go. And pop it in at the beginning, like so. So I've got those, those elements that I'm, I'm just copying over to make it obvious that I'm, how I'm doing this. I'm just reusing my existing definition code for my, for my module. And then I would just like to make this calculator available as my export object. And in order to do that, I would now, uh, I'll leave this in as a comment right here, I would do module.exports equals calculator. Right? So it's a, it's a curiosity of the way Node evaluates this, that you need to prefix exports with a module in this case. Uh, if you just do exports equals calculator, it doesn't work because it's not picked up in the structure in the right way. So by doing this here, I should now be able to use multiplication as well as adding. That works just fine. Uh, and I'm now publishing my functionality as a Node-compatible module. Right? That's how easy that really is. Nothing else to it. This is based on the common JS pattern. Um, let me check my notes to see if I'm missing something. Yeah, no. So um, that, that is obviously very simple to do, really. The question of, uh, oh, there is a question, actually. Please go ahead. They are only available, well, in Node, the convention is, um, where am I? Here we go. In Node, the convention is that you will only have those objects explicitly, right? So Node never actually does anything in the global namespace, uh, or you're not supposed to be doing that in your applications either. I mean, you can in the end. In a Node application, you might have an, a, um, a starting point, like your app.js, if you do uh, uh, any one of the frameworks or stuff like that. And in that, in that uh, startup file, you will usually find a variety of these require instructions instructions there. Um, that's, that's the main starting point. Um, but you can also, well, you can then either uh, pass through in some interesting module that you're going to reuse somewhere else later, you can pass that through to some other point in your node architecture, if you like. Or, on the other hand, you can just have additional require calls later on again uh, that will make that module available to you a second time, right? Anyway, that's how it works. It's not supposed to live in the global namespace at any point. That is, that is their convention, really. I mean, if it wasn't, of course, uh, you would be free to do with the object whatever you like, right? So if you would like to have it in the global space, and never mind what the Node guys think. Uh, <laughs> fair enough, there's nothing to keep you from doing that as well. But that's the way it works here, um, and that's the way they prefer to do it in Node. So that's the, the simple pattern here. Um, the other one that I wanted to show you is the AMD pattern. So let's see, um, I think I'll show you this HTML file first here. Now with AMD, um, oh, hang on, I'm forgetting something actually. I think there's a slide on AMD, first of all, exactly, right? So AMD uh, has the idea of a defined function. So instead of just uh, creating a module as a file like I just did, right? I didn't actually do anything to tell the system, hey, this is my module, right? It's just, it just, it, it, it exists, that's all. There's a file that has a name, and that's how it's recognized. With AMD, you're supposed to call a define function to tell the system, the loader in the end, uh, what your module is, and what its name is, and so on. And also, by the way, what its dependencies are, because we didn't get that with CommonJS, right? There was no dependency thing in there. Um, with AMD, we do have this, and the define function allows you to define dependencies as well. Now, you also require a module loader, and in the case of Node, I already had one, basically, that is built into Node, if you like. Uh, in the case of AMD, I, I'm going to have to take care myself of, of making some kind of a module loader available, and I've, I'm choosing one that is probably the most common of those existing right now, which is called require.js. So uh, that library, require.js, is, uh, is a module loader that is compatible with the AMD pattern. It also supports other patterns, but that's, that's the main thing that people use today. As a result, I'm just simply referencing that script in my little HTML page here, and I've got this uh, extra 
extra tag on here that tells it to automatically load a JavaScript file called main.js right in the beginning here. And this main.js thing is a piece of code where I'm using require again, just in a, in a different syntax to what we did before, to load two modules. And the two modules I'm looking for are called jQuery and calculator AMD. And when those two are loaded, they are passed into my function that comes here as parameters. So I'm taking my jQuery object as uh, the dollar parameter again, just for uh, you know, the, the unique uh, effect of it, and my calculator object as well. And then I've got a few helpers, and this basically just implements the functionality of uh, very uh, manually hooking into various events there so that I can quickly test my calculator from the web page, right? So that's all that, that thing does, really. Nothing surprising in that. So the, the thing, of course, is the module loading here. And um, now, there, there should be, as we can guess here, a module called Calculator AMD, of course, which uh, I already have here, but it doesn't really exist yet. So I'm just going to show you how we can add this in there, and I'll go back to my, uh, my original code one more time and pop in those pieces that we need. So the other parts were uh, down here, I think. So again, you know, I'm, I'm just doing this to point out that you don't have to do anything special in order to use these features. You can just use your existing stuff. Um, and what, what it misses here, of course, is the define function. Now, the define function takes a parameter that specifies the name of the module, that should be calculator AMD, and it also takes a list of dependencies, where currently I don't have any, and then it takes a function as a parameter, and that function um, gets uh, nothing, well, actually, right, nothing passed in right now. Sorry, I was getting ahead of myself there for a second. Um, and this is supposed to return the actual module implementation when it is called. Okay, this is not called immediately. This is called by the module loader, and it depends upon the evaluation of the dependency chain when it is actually going to be called in the end. So when this happens, I should now return an implementation of my module, which of course in my case is the already existing calculator variable again, right? Like this. So uh, as a result, I should now be able to open that file. Let me see if that works. Uh, where are we? There we are. So this is my absolutely fantastic web page that I've implemented. Isn't it crazy how Chrome doesn't resize the buttons to fit the text? Oh, no. No, no styles on this implementation, right? So let's add those and it gives me 9 and multiply them gives me 20. So that seems to work correctly. You can see, if you look at the, uh, the network traffic and stuff like that here, um, yeah, that's the one, isn't it? Let's just reload this. You can see how the individual files are being loaded, right? So um, let's try to resize this a bit. Oh, got to resize more. Oh, <laughs> uh, what am I doing? I don't have to resize, do I? Because the names are right here in the beginning. So <laughs> let's see. We're loading main.js, and then we're loading jQuery, and then we're loading calculator amd.js, right? We can basically see exactly how this loading mechanism works step by step and pulls in all the various items that I need in order to run my functionality in the end. So that is the basics of how AMD works. Um, use a loader. There are several others out there if you don't like require for some reason. I personally do, but uh, there's a choice. And then create your module by using the define instruction. Something interesting about this, by the way, is that the define doesn't have to be the only define in one particular file necessarily, right? I mean, of course, you have to make sure somehow that your defines all get evaluated. So if you use require, the, uh, the main piece of advice that they give you really to, to totally make use of the require functionality is to only load require itself from your main HTML file. I mean, that's a recommendation. You don't have to adhere to it. But I'm mentioning it now because if you think about it, uh, or you, if you think about the option of having more than one define in the same JavaScript file, of course, the automatic mechanism of loading this via the module and file name is not going to work anymore because there will only be one file name, but that corresponds to more than one module in that case, right? So you, 
you would then have to load the file with the defines inside yourself somehow, so that so, the, so that the loader is actually aware of uh, where those modules are. There are also ways of doing advanced custom uh, sorry configuration with uh, require JS. So I should mention this. That's an alternative. You can basically tell require what the exact structure is and so on. Anyway, it's something that comes to mind once you see the structure of this that you may now combine in any way you like. And uh, that is true, you can. However, you, just, you still have to do some additional work if you move away from the basic idea of having a module per file kind of thing, right? So um, that's how that thing works. Uh, let me just quickly check my notes if I've got anything important I wanted to mention. Right. Um, oh, yeah, well, actually, I did want to do one more thing, that's true, um, which is I wanted to point out the fact that we're not re really taking advantage of the dependency feature yet in here, right? So I could take my adder and pull it out into its own module. I've got an adder JS here, so let's pop it in here. And then I could also have a define line down there, like this, um, and define an adder module, right? So this would be uh, the adder object. So I've got my adder module defined. And now I can take advantage of the uh, dependency feature. So I'll pop my adder in here. And then I should probably also change something about my initialization order because it makes more sense now to do it like this. And I'll show you in a second why that is. Let me just indent this a bit. Because the adder will now be passed in as a parameter to this internal function here. And um, of course, only when the adder is available can I actually use the augmentation here for my calculator. Now, of course, in, in reality, maybe you would just uh, have your entire definition inside the block here, right? So that's fair enough. I just wanted to make the minimum change that you need in order to make this work. And that does require changing the initialization order ever so slightly, because otherwise it's not going to work anymore. So with this implementation we have now, my code should still work in the same way. Let's try to reload this whole thing. And uh, actually, I've seen this before. Sometimes uh, web pages that have used require.js with uh, Chrome in order to load their stuff don't reload quite correctly. Oh, something's wrong with my multiplication. What happened there? No method mult. What am I doing wrong? Oh, right, I'm doing something wrong that I frequently do wrong when I do this demo, right? I've, I can't use a second var in there, of course, because the, uh, the var will otherwise override the calculator. So, okay, let's uh, tr try this one more time. There we go. Reopen the page, always a good recommendation if you find that Chrome doesn't appear to be reloading your page correctly. Uh, that happens apparently with require occasionally when files have been loaded after the fact by the require library. Okay, so that's something else I wanted to show you with the dependencies because that's really the idea, of course, of building those change and, uh, chains and having those reusable blocks and everything in there. And I think um, I'm almost done. I did, oh, right, one final thing to show you. I wanted to show you how, how you can use both patterns at the same time. And I just recommend you look at an existing library for that purpose. For example, here's jQuery. Right at the end of it, we have a piece of code that looks like this here. Um, so they basically just check if they are in a particular environment right here. They check if there's a module that exports, for example, stuff like that. And if that is the case, they initialize module exports uh, to the jQuery object, right? Similar to what I was showing you with my calculator object. Otherwise, if that does not exist, they make themselves available uh, through the window like so. That's what you usually end up using in a browser. And they also check if there is a define function available for the AMD pattern, and if so, they call define in order to make jQuery available to an AMD compatible loader, right? So that's not too hard to do. You can't create modules that adhere to more than one of those patterns at the same time, which of course gives you know, your users the most flexible approaches uh, to load your modules, whether they use them on the server side or the client side or whatever. Um, finally, I've got some bullets here that you might want to look at because there's more to say on the topic, of course. 
Require JS has quite a lot of functionality that I haven't shown you now. Uh, for example, it, it can load jQuery and its individual submodules in a particular way. There's uh, special support for that one. They also have this optimizer, which is a build time tool that allows you to minify and combine JavaScript files. So you may end up having to load just one JavaScript file uh, from the server when a requirement is fulfilled through the dependency chain, right? That, that kind of thing. So that's pretty cool. Um, and it can also be used server side. So if you think AMD is cool and you don't really like the common JS based module loading like you do in Node typically, you can uh, use a module in Node that corresponds to require and then load your other modules through the AMD pattern uh, even on the server side. So that's also possible. Um, and you can go the other way. That's my final bullet here. Tools like browser Browserify and a few others that have the same kind of purpose allow you to use common JS modules on the client side. They basically have a wrapper that uh, supplements the uh, uh, the um asynchronous loading mechanism that we have in the AMD pattern um, and allows you to use the common JS pattern type modules uh, in the client even though they don't normally load asynchronously. Right? So that's automatic in that way. Right, so stuff for you to look at. Otherwise, we're out of time, I think, and that's all I had to say. So I'll just wrap it up right now and say thank you very much. If you have any queries, I'll be around till tomorrow evening and you can always send me an email if you like. Thanks for being here, guys. Thank you.